Let me share with you, church, just something that happened this past week. It's not what I was planning to say, but just someone came in for prayer, um, and they said, you know, I, I, I think... I think I'm hearing from God, and I, I think I'm hearing from the universe. And, you know, uh, there was some, you know, reaching out to tarot cards because maybe there's something valid there, and, and reaching out to Wicca because maybe there's something valid there. And I said, do you know what? What if all of it is just Jesus? What if it's Jesus who is calling your name? And by the time that friend walked out of the prayer appointment. She said, I know now, I know that all of these different ways that I was searching and trying to give credibility and, and respect to all of these different religions, I know it's Jesus. And she was even correcting herself instead of what would come out of her mouth out of habit to say, you know, the universe told me to do this. Actually, she said, Jesus, it was Jesus who told me to come in for prayer today. It's Jesus who wants to walk with me and to shepherd my life. And that's what he wants to do in our community. There's a, a spiritual hunger that is stirring, but people don't know his name. And that's what we get to do. We get to say, the, the God of love has a name, and his name is Jesus. Isn't that our privilege? So we're in this Easter series right now called Encountering Jesus. And uh, a, a scholar that I think is quite brilliant, he says that we as humans have only the capacity either to love or to judge other people. We can't do both. And this has been a challenge in my own life just to really consider, is this statement true? And if it is, how are you going to react? Because don't we all have a propensity within ourselves to judge other people? Don't we have hurt in our own lives from those times when others judge us and judge us wrongly. Do you remember the last time that someone misunderstood you? Do you remember the last time they judged you? Sometimes it's very close to you. It's the people that you live with and you feel misunderstood and unseen. And sometimes it's people who are far away from you and they totally misjudge the situation. This happens to me quite often um, for whatever reason. And uh, I remember... I was uh, sitting at, at church on five and talking to, to one of uh, my ministry leaders and, and I was um, quite emotional and I was just telling them that, you know, uh, so many of the, the kids that I pastored in youth group in various cities, you know, are beginning to walk away from the Lord. And I was, I was just having this conversation which was totally about my life. It was nothing about anybody else. And the person who was leading worship that day called Chris the next day. And they said, I know Rachel must have been criticizing me after the service because I saw her talking to that other person and I just know in my heart she must have been criticizing how I led worship. <laughs> and I was like, what? What? See, this is a propensity within ourselves, right? That obviously there was something within that person's life that was wounded or insecure or something they needed to deal with, but they felt judged and, and that was totally... 100% not the reality of what was going on. But then in turn, I felt judged. I said, oh, why, is, why would you ever think that? I'm so grateful that you led worship. I'm so grateful for how God is moving. Why would you ever think that? And, you know, I don't always have the answers to those things. But today I want to turn and reflect on a story and on our human propensity, how easy it is for us to judge other people. And what Jesus actually asks of us in return. And so we're going to turn to, I think, one of the most beautiful stories. I mean, there's so many wonderful stories in the Gospels. But we're going to turn to Luke 7 this morning. And I, I want to bring this story alive for you. So we'll, we'll read the scripture. But I also want to kind of explain some of the background of what is going on here. And in this series, as you know if you've been here, we've been reflecting on questions that Jesus asks in scripture. And to say, what would he want to ask us? And here we see in this passage, Jesus is asking the question, why are you bothering this woman? And I've paraphrased it to kind of capture what Jesus is saying. And my paraphrase would be something like, why are you judging this woman for her devotion to me? Why are you judging this woman? 
And here's the story in in Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 36. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from the city heard that he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She is a sinner. Let's pause there for a second. I want to give you some background to this story and what is going on. So Jesus has been invited to a home and often when he was teaching and speaking in certain cities, right, there would be people who would host him, but the whole community would kind of know where Jesus was. And you have to just picture people are so enthralled with Jesus and they're all so hungry and he has bread and they're also hurting in their bodies and he has miraculous power. And so the whole town would have known where Jesus was eating. And so here we have Jesus coming into this home and customary to the culture, he would have received honor or he, I should say, he should have received honor when he went into this house. He should have received kisses as he was greeted at the door and water and olive oil to wash his hands and to wash his feet. And grace should have been said over the meal. And here, this woman from the community, this woman who has the the text would have us believe, has heard Jesus preaching in the community. And she has had her life changed already by the forgiveness of Jesus when she heard him preaching. And now she comes looking for him. And the response of the town is, where is Jesus? He's at the home of Simon eating dinner. And she comes with this alabaster jar to honor him. And what she experiences is that Jesus has not been honored in this home. And that all of the things that were so customary, things that we would say when people come into our home, can I hang up your coat? Can I get you a drink of water? Can I offer you any refreshments? Just customary things of manners had not happened for Jesus. And this woman, she sees this happening. Why is she weeping? She is weeping because this is such a public humiliation to Jesus that the honor that he is due, that any prophet would have received, has been slighted for him. And this woman begins to weep. And at the same time, she's brought this alabaster jar. You have heard, if you've grown up in the church, about the alabaster jar. We know that this woman was sinful. The connotation here is that she was a prostitute in her old life before she came to Christ. And here she has brought this alabaster jar of what? This is her profession. This is worth a year's worth of wages. And this is from her life as a prostitute that she would bring all of who she used to be before him. And here, seeing Jesus humiliated, she thinks, how can I honor where he has been withheld honor? And she wants to anoint his head. And even, in fact, in some other passages similar to this, we see Jesus' head being anointed. But because of the shape of the table and how people would recline towards the food, his head and his hands were not given access to her. But what she thought I could do for Jesus is I could wash his feet. His feet were dirty and smelly, as were everybody's feet in that culture, which is why when you entered anyone's home, your feet were washed by the servant, and yet Jesus had been neglected this honor. For whatever reason, Simon withheld these customs from Jesus. And the woman approaches Jesus and she anoints him with the perfume and she washes his feet with her hair. If you know anything about the Jewish culture, it was very brazen for a woman to let her hair down. It was inappropriate. It was kept for a husband on the wedding night and outside that it was considered very lewd and very sexual. And the 
the Pharisees were looking at Jesus and saying, if you knew what kind of woman this is, if you're any kind of prophet, you would know who this was. And Jesus has three choices here. He can reject the woman. He can kind of try to cover over what she's done and make excuses. Hey, religious leaders, I'm so sorry. This happens once in a while. Ugh, it's very extravagant. We try to keep these sinners at bay. I'm really sorry, guys. I'll tell her to go to the temple. Or he can look at the costly sacrifice that she is bringing to him and the humiliation that she will suffer if he rejects her. He can look at the person in front of him and he can accept her worship. So these are three, three options that Jesus has. Does he make himself more palatable to the disgust of the religious leaders? Why are they so disgusted anyway? When anyone shows extravagant devotion for Jesus, the people in the room that are religious and half-hearted will be offended. And this is what Jesus says. He says, Simon, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told the story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to the other. But neither of them could repay him, so he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Simon answered, well, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Then he looked to the woman and said to Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the moment I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven, so she has shown me much love. But a person who has forgiven little shows only little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. The man at the table said among themselves, who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. I think this woman and what she does is such a beautiful picture of extravagant devotion to Jesus. And when we see extravagant devotion in the life of people, it makes us uncomfortable. You know, I was at a conference once, and one of the speakers came out and just did this on the ground. They were supposed to be preaching. And they lay like that on the ground until the Lord released them to get up and preach their message. See, it's so uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable when people are extravagant. It's uncomfortable when they are so wholehearted that they are loud and they are weeping and they are disruptive. This woman came in and disrupted the whole dinner. She was not welcome in this home but she was welcomed by Jesus. And whereas Jesus might not have said beforehand, yes, please let your hair loose and cry all over me, that's what I want. When the woman does it out of a pure heart of devotion, he receives it as worship. And he sees her heart. He sees the heart of the person in front of him and the forgiveness that is overflowing into love. And he is able to see who she is and receive that. And yet he has some words for Simon too. And I want to kind of talk through just what would Jesus say to us in this picture of someone who is religious, skeptical, and half-hearted towards Christ. He has welcomed Christ into his home, and yet he is not willing to call him Christ. He says, maybe you're a prophet, maybe you're not. I've got some questions for you. 
He welcomes them into his home, but he withholds honor. He withholds devotion. And then we have this woman, the wrong kind of woman. Don't you love that Jesus is a friend of sinners and a friend of women? Don't you love that he loves all the wrong kind of people? Listen, if you aren't much for religion, I'm not much for religion either. And I don't think Jesus is much for religion either. See, religion is kind of this man-made system of how we're going to clean ourselves up and make us good enough for God. And Simon the Pharisee, man, the Pharisees thought they were good people. They thought they were doing everything right. And in comes this woman weeping and breaking a year's worth of perfume. In some other accounts, we have the disciples saying, shouldn't this money have been given to the poor? Well, aren't you self-righteous? And Jesus receives what this is. In fact, in some other passages, it's put in the narrative closer to the cross and seen as a kind of coronation of the king on his way to the cross. And here, Jesus has some words for us this morning as we consider love, grace, and judgment in our own lives. So here's the first thing I want to talk about. It is intuitive for us to judge other people, even as we are blind to our own sin. And you and I, even those of us who are endeavoring to follow Jesus, don't we know this? Don't we know the propensity within our own hearts to judge other people? And see, Simon was caught up in his own self-righteousness to say, well, my sin isn't that bad. I'm not all that bad. And Jesus tells this parable, in fact, to the very point that whether you owe 50, 50, what was the denomination of money? (laughs) $50. Whether you owe $50 or $500 or $500 million, the whole point of Jesus' parable is that neither person can pay. Neither person can compensate. And in fact, in the Jewish system, if you are a prostitute, there isn't really a way for you to compensate for your sins. But Jesus comes in and he says, grace covers what you can never compensate. But he's trying to allow Simon to see the exact same thing. That you're looking at this woman and thinking about her sin and thinking about how inappropriate it is that she is here, but you can't cover your own sin either. It doesn't matter if you think your sins aren't that bad. And see, all of us have this tendency within us. This is what Martin Lloyd-Jones says. You will never make yourself feel as if you are a sinner because there is a mechanism in you as a result of sin that defends yourself against every accusation. We are all on very good terms with ourselves and we put up a very good case for ourselves. Even if we try to make ourselves feel that we are sinners, we can never do it. There is only one way to know that we are sinners, and that is to have some dim, glimmering conception of the greatness of God. See, we are sinners because the Word tells us that we are all sinners. Sin isn't a feeling. We know that, right? You can look out into our culture and you can even look at the things that you and I do that the Word says you should not do. And judgment is one of those things. Do not judge others lest you are judging the speck in their own eye when there is a log in your eye, right? Matthew chapter 7. But Jesus brings up that when we judge other people, even people that mistreat us, how about that? How about the people we feel we have a right to judge? Even people that don't think highly of us. And he says, don't forget, don't forget, I am the judge, and all of us have a debt that we cannot pay. All of us stand equal in forgiveness, but the person who cannot recognize their sin cannot receive the forgiveness that they need, and therefore the love and devotion to Christ is cut off in their life because they're too busy being self-righteous and saying, I'm not that bad right? Self-righteousness cuts us off from wholehearted devotion. Here's 
Here's the second thing I want to say. Is that it is always Jesus' joy to rescue and befriend sinners. And most of all, you and I. It is Jesus' joy. I've been doing some reading in my, in my devotional reading and some reading of, of Thomas Merton and some of the Puritan writers, and they have reminded me that it is Jesus' joy that actually when you and I are struggling with sin, that it is Jesus' heart that is drawn to us in our sin. See, we get tired of our own battle with sin, don't we? We get tired of struggling with the same old thing. And you know, we feel the judgment of other people and we feel that other people get tired of the ways that we struggle with sin. But do you know who is not tired of the struggle with sin? It is Christ. Because when we are struggling with sin and we come to him with it, his heart is drawn out to us in compassion because we are his children. And sometimes we think, oh, Jesus is disappointed in me. He's disgusted with me. I've been fighting this battle for so long. But listen, Jesus it is his joy to rescue and befriend sinners. Do you really understand this? I'm not just talking about the worst person you can imagine. I'm not talking about the person off the street. I'm talking about you and the sin that you still struggle with in your life. Sins of the things that we shouldn't do and yet we do them. And the sins of things that we should do. And yet we don't do them. And it is his joy to walk with you. It is his joy to rescue you, not just one time for salvation, but to rescue you again and again and again. And sometimes we don't have this picture of sin. We think he's disappointed in us. We think he's judging us. We think he's disgusted with us because that's how we feel about ourselves. But it is his joy to rescue us, even when we are still struggling with sin. Chris and I, in one of our ministries, we had someone that we were very close to, and he just, uh, he made some choices he shouldn't have made. You know, he made some bad choices. He, he stole some things, and he was drinking underage, and he was just kind of going off the rails. And everyone in his life was giving him, like, the tough love, and, and they were like, you know, he, 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 he had to leave his home, and he was living in his car. And when he came to us, I don't know what he was expecting us to say. But what we said was, we love you. Come stay with us. It's not too late to change things. We believe in you. See, do you have this vision in your life that you are Christ's child and he will never let you go? Do you have this vision that his persevering love is greater than the ways that you struggle? Do you have this vision for your life that he is coming after you again and again. And every time you fall and every time you fail, or maybe it's not you, maybe it is you looking at the people in your life and you are like, man, I'm praying so hard for this person, but they're never going to get it together. Do you have this vision that Jesus' love for them is so great and he, he's not disgusted by sin? Look at, his, look at his treatment of this woman and see Think about God and Moses. Think about the Old Testament view that God could not be in the same realm as sin because God was too holy. Is that what we see in Jesus? Of course he calls us out of our sin, but he calls us out of our sin from a place of healing for us and a place of our tears all over his feet and a place of defense against those who would judge us with a religious and self-righteous spirit and say, this is my child. And see, he is never against you, even when you are in sin and in rebellion. He is with you against that which is destroying you. He is with you in this struggle. It is me and Jesus over here and this thing that is attacking me on the other side. And he says, I am not disgusted. I am not frustrated. It is my joy to be in this battle with you and raise you up once again. So if you're here today and you are struggling or if there are people in your life that you in a human perspective are struggling with, 
just know Christ's heart perseveres with joy. Don't miss that part. It is his joy to forgive sinners. It is his joy to forgive sinners, the worst of which is you and me. Do we know, as Paul knew, do we know, as great saints have known, that the sinner that I need to be worried about is me? Do we know that? And even when those very human thoughts of judgment towards others, and listen, sometimes a thought arises, it's what you do with that thought that matters. You can't control that split-second judgment, but you can control in saying, Jesus, direct my focus towards myself. That I'm not so concerned about others and their relationship with you. Direct me towards myself, because if I'm focused on judging other people, man, I become blind. I become blind to what he wants to do in my life. I become so Dane Ortland in his great book Gentle and Lowly he gives us this glimpse at an imaginary conversation with Jesus. Jesus, you don't understand. I've really messed up in all kinds of ways. I know, he says. You know most of it, sure, certainly more than what others can see. But there is perversity down inside me that, that's hidden from everyone. I know it all. Well, the thing is, it isn't just my past. It's my present, too. I understand. But I don't know if I can break free of this anytime soon. That's the only kind of person that I am here to help. But the burden is heavy. It's heavier all the time. Then let me carry it. It is too much to bear. Not for me, child. You don't get it. My offenses aren't directed towards others. They are against you. Then I am the one who's most suited to forgive them. But the more ugliness in me that you discover, you'll get fed up with me, Jesus. Whoever comes to me, I will never cast them out. John 6. I will never let them go. It is his joy to befriend and forgive sinners. But here's the thing. He is trying in his tenderness not only to criticize Simon, but to discipline him because he does not only love this woman, he loves Simon. Even though Simon is blind right now, he loves him. And we should not run from the discipline of the Lord. I encourage you, if you haven't read Hebrews 12 in a while, read Hebrews 12 in your own devotional time this week. This is what it says, verse 5, Have you forgotten the encouraging word God spoke to you as his children? He said, My child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline, and don't give up when he corrects you, for the Lord disciplines those that he loves and he punishes each one he accepts as his child. As you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Who ever heard of a child who was never disciplined by his father? Mm. God's discipline is always good for us so that we might share in his holiness. No discipline is enjoyable while it is happening. It is painful. But afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. See, Jesus doesn't only have a heart for this woman. He has a heart for Simon. He has a heart for Simon that Simon will come to this place of realizing that following Jesus isn't about being a good person. It isn't about being better than other people. It's about being a dead person that was raised to life. It's about recognizing the forgiveness that is present for you and lavishing wholehearted love on Jesus from your position and your history. Here's the third thing that I want to say this morning. Wholehearted devotion exalts Christ to his rightful place in our lives. Yes, wholehearted devotion, it offends the religious. It offends the half-hearted. But it exalts Christ to his rightful place. 
And as we see this woman, she brings all of herself to Christ. She brings her past, who she used to be. And guess what? He can be trusted with all of us. He can be trusted for us not to be half-hearted with him, but to say, Lord, all of me belongs to you. She brings all of him, and her worship is costly. Did you know worship costs us? It costs us to be wholehearted towards Christ. It costs us to say one yes and many no's. And he would say to us this morning, he would say to us, where are you in your devotion to me? Where are you in your wholeheartedness towards me that you could trust me with all of you, even the battles that you are still fighting, that you could know my persevering love is over your life and to know and stand in the freedom of his forgiveness and not the knowledge that we are a person who isn't that bad and we don't mess up that much. See, that's falling back into relying on ourselves. But it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've done when you've abandoned yourself to Christ and said, all of me for all of you. And it's this kind of devotion that exalts Christ and recognizes him as king. This woman recognizes Jesus for who he really is when the Pharisees have not yet come to that point. And they, they say, who is this man that he can forgive sins? Because only God for, can forgive sins. Only Yahweh can forgive sins. And this woman should be taking her worship and taking it to the temple. Jesus says, no, you're forgiven because I am the divine presence of God here in this world. I am the great I am. And because she understands who she is, someone who has been forgiven much, this love lavishes on Jesus in such a wholehearted way. See, those who have been forgiven little in their own mind, I'm not that bad, we will love little. But those who realize all that Christ has done, we will break that alabaster jar. We will lavish our lives upon him. And when you see people who are wholehearted before Christ, it will either make you offended and uncomfortable or it will challenge you to bring all of yourself to him. What's he saying to you today? I have a friend right now who exhibits this wholeheartedness so well. She's just going through such a trial in her life. And... Uh, her husband has left her very unexpectedly and she is on her face before God. She is on her knees before God. She's clinging to Jesus. She is praying for her husband to return. She is not wavering for one second in her faith. No matter what life throws at her, it's again and again. It's not the one time bringing that wholehearted devotion to him. It's in the midst of the trials and battles that life brings to us because if you don't know this life is a battle, man, you're going to be caught off guard again and again. And we can't control the battles that come into our life so many times. Sometimes we cause the conflict. That's a whole different thing, okay? But many times we aren't in control of what comes into our life. But it's breaking that jar before him again and again when we've lost everything. When we have this way we thought our life would turn out and everything falls apart and the only thing that we have is Jesus. It's saying, you still have my whole heart. You still have my whole life. I will weep before you. I will give you the honor that other people will not honor you with. May our lives, may our lives be a life that we are weeping on the feet of Jesus rather than saying, yeah, Jesus, you can come in my home, but there's no honor for you here. There's no priority for you here. Right? And he frees us up. He frees us up from our natural bent towards judging other people. And he says, just walk in this forgiveness. Just walk in this grace. And this love for me, keep your focus 
on what I have done for you. And you are free to love other people without 